Good morning. My name is Marin Tirabasi, and I'm a member of this church and glad to be the guest preacher for this Sunday. Um, look ahead. Brad was going to be away all week, and he was away some of the week, but he loved the anthem so much that he says, I have to sing in the choir. So at least through the anthem, he's here. But that just tells you what an amazing piece of music you're going to be hearing. I had the opportunity yesterday to be at the um, United Church of Christ New England Women's Celebration, and the keynote speaker was Marsha McPhee, who is the person who created this Lenten series for us. And she did an amazing speech yesterday morning, and she herself spoke, sang, danced. That was her first career. Got people talking to one another, played a drum, and clicked her own slides. <laughs> I'm just saying, this is a little complicated, and I'm new to this, and I actually can't walk and chew gum. <laughs> but though we may, um, I might miss something. The entering the picture, the entering into the passion of Christ in this way is one of the unique parts of this Lent, as is, of course, you're also contributing your own photographs to that ongoing uh, connection. I will say, in terms of bulletin announcements, I do the announcements and then do a brief piece of writing, and then Dawn and the choir do the Enter the Story song, and then I have a few more words from the text about this Sunday's uh, theme, and then it actually becomes leader and people, as in your bulletin. So unless you'd like to join the choir, which I think there are many open spaces. <laughs> you won't be singing the first time around. Please make note in the bulletin of the opportunity to be a part of one great hour of sharing, which we are um, gathering together uh, during this season. And it is the um, pot doesn't sound right right after St. Patrick's Day, but it is it is the money that is held for emergencies, for earthquakes and floods and fires. Part of this mission work, which is a little different than the autumn, Neighbors in Need, direct assistance to people, this is the money uh, that is across denominations and is held so that whenever a tragedy happens, there is money that can go to it directly rather than having to, to come and ask for people. So we invite your generosity to be a part of that, um, that gift. Either uh, there are envelopes at the back, yes, um, or electronically uh, citing that it's for one great hour of sharing. Um, as the page turns, the book group is reading Leanne Moriarty's What Alice Forgot this week. There is, again, choir rehearsal prayer time, breakfast with Brad, and we come around to worship. Are there other announcements that we should lift up from the congregation? Does anyone have anything? Martin, even though I'm not here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Part of me not being here this, um, this weekend was uh, we hosted an event yes. from through the main conference here on uh, yesterday and um, we provided hospitality uh, for 30 some odd uh, guests from different churches in our York Association, actually as far up as South Portland. Um, and uh, once again, we, we knocked it out of the park. Um, the, you know, the, the kitchen crew called in a lot of, uh, a lot of our top people to, to make the pastor's favorite stuff. Um, and, uh, and everybody else appreciated that. So um, also thanks to uh, Tom and Alan and, and everybody who, who helped to set up and clean up 
Um, it was, uh, we, we put a good face on for Second Christian yesterday, so. Yay, okay. I also want to welcome those of you who are part of our online congregation, and usually I do that a little bit earlier, but wanted to do that because I have a particular request. For those of you who are online, if you happen to be um, watching this service uh, in a room without any other folks, I would like to invite you to get a piece of paper and something to write with for later on in our service. So uh, to be prepared that way. And as always, we say to you, as we say to everyone who's in the pews, and everyone who is thinking about this church and praying for this church in other places, that you all together make this an amazing gathering of community of faith in the Spirit of God. We continue our journey through Lent as we step inside the story full of difficult moments. We put ourselves in the picture of Holy Week so that we might look closer and let the ancient story open us to a deeper love for Jesus. Besides the Last Supper, Holy Week contains another important story that happens at dinner. Earlier in the week, Jesus and his followers gather for a meal, and a woman shows up unexpectedly to anoint Jesus in an extravagant show of devotion. To say she caused quite a stir might be understating a bit. We imagine ourselves in the room and we see the looks of judgment and even outrage on the faces around us. Are we ourselves moved by her generosity and outpouring of emotion? Or are we uncomfortable as Jesus refers to his own death? Does our complaining or anger really serve to hide our fears? Jesus invites us to tell this story in remembrance of her. What uncomfortable stories are we called to tell in our time?
It is so hard, oh, I'm sorry, let me acknowledge, let us acknowledge our brokenness as we pray together. It is so hard to not be afraid. Sometimes our fear makes us less compassionate and more judgmental. We think we can ward off getting hurt by holding back, unwilling to risk putting ourselves out there for the sake of love. Forgive us, O oh God. Encourage us to extravagant acts of love, especially when we are frightened. You entered our story through Jesus. Now help us to enter fully into the story of your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. The words to our opening hymn are printed on the back of your bulletins. Let us sing, A Prophet Woman Broke a Jar. Know this, there is no limit on love. Love doesn't run out. So you can start giving more of it any time. You are forgiven and freed, encouraged and loved by a God who wants you to live fully. Let us enter the passion of Christ and share the peace of Christ with each other. The peace of Christ is with you all. And also with you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
The story of the woman with the alabaster jar appears in all four Gospels. Usually that means that it is such an extraordinary moment that no one would forget. Not only that, but Jesus also makes a point to instruct those present to remember this woman. Alongside this story today, let us hear the psalmist, who also speaks of extravagant love and presence in the midst of the valleys and the shadows of death. The tradition of anointing with oil goes back a long way. And in this psalm, the image of being bathed in oil is set at a table on which an overflowing cup symbolizes the kind of love we are to emulate as children of God and disciples of Jesus. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He lets me rest in grassy meadows. He leads me to restful waters. He keeps me alive. He guides me in proper paths for the sake of his good name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no danger because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they protect me. You set a table for me right in front of my enemies. You bathe my head in oil. My cup is so full it spills over. Yes, goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the Lord's house as long as I live. From Mark's Gospel, the 14th chapter. While Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar, a very costly ointment of nard, and she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, why was this ointment wasted in this way? This ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish. But you will not always have me. She's done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her.
None of us around the table liked the way things were going here in Jerusalem. The conversation had turned to the dire situation for the people we had encountered, those who were hungry, poor, sick, disturbed. Does the Roman state care about them? No. At least we try. Every penny we can scrape up, we try to pass on to those who need it. I had to wonder, though, whether the talk of asking our patrons for more money right now was really because we are afraid. Before Jesus arrived to dinner that night, some of the disciples had said, perhaps we should be saving money in case we needed to hide in the not too distant future. And then she walked in. I saw the jar she carried, beautiful, alabaster. And as soon as I smelled the oil, as she began to anoint Jesus, I knew it was expensive. Across the table, the others were beginning to stop their conversations and looks of contempt began to cross their faces. Mumbling began. It seemed a ridiculous waste given what we had just been talking about. That kind of money could go a long way. Although she had not said a word, I could sense her intensity and devotion. This love lavished on him was somewhat embarrassing, and yet it was what I really wanted to do, tell him how he had changed my life and how finally I had purpose in my life. I felt loved, and it was such a gift but how can you offer any gift to this beloved one? He is the anointed one, appointed by God. But here she is anointing him. I realized that what I felt was jealousy mixed with a deep fear that we were losing him. I think we are all afraid of losing him. He tells us to stop judging her. She is preparing me for burial. No, I thought, don't say that. It can't happen. Later, I will remember her just as he asked me to do. And I will remember that he asked us to care for all people the way she cared for him that night. Our hymn is number 480, I Love to Tell the Story.
Let us pray. May the dripping of our words be a blessing. May our hearts be open to danger and hope and wonder. And in this old story, let us find ourselves willing to be givers and to give what is deepest in us. Amen. Amen. When you walk away from church this morning, take away this takeaway. You've heard and hopefully entered the story about the woman who gave Jesus the idea for the Last Supper. Okay? You've heard and hopefully entered the story about the woman who gave Jesus the idea for the Last Supper. Truly, I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. And so every time we share that supper, we say, do this in remembrance of me, speaking Jesus' words. There is that repeated language. There's also the fact that in the Gospel of Mark, there are only three verses between this first dinner and the Last Supper. Only three verses, and if you're curious, it's when Judas goes out and makes a decision to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus creates our covenant meal out of the traditional Passover by eliminating the bitter herbs, the lamb that was on that table but was too expensive for any of the poor of that time, and probably the empty chair for Elijah must have had a conversation on the Transfiguration Hill. And he knew that what he will be giving, like her unexpected and extravagant gift, what he will be giving is freely given. As Kathy said, this is one of the very few four for four stories told in all four gospels, like stilling the storm, feeding the 4,000, the transfiguration. The parables and the healing reports are different between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, depending on their sources. But this eyewitness account of this supper is in all four. So we have the actual eyewitness. We have Mark. He was a teenager eyewitness at the Last Supper, and he followed the disciples to, Jerusalem, to Gethsemane. At the arrest of Jesus, the text says, the text in Mark says, a certain young man was following Jesus, wearing nothing but a linen cloth. The soldiers caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off naked. That's him. That's Mark. That's his one bit of his saying that he was a story. And he became a follower of Peter, and so most of the earlier ministry of Jesus that he tells comes through Peter. And it is believable that at about 55 years old, this 16-year-old teen in 70, when Mark was written, could have been telling the story. Also, it's not a very Greek literate gospel. The others were written between 90 and 120, so they're unlikely to have been actual eyewitnesses. They've gathered together the oral tradition, Paul, Mark, and an anonymous source called Q, which is a bunch of sayings, which is why the sayings appear in different places in the gospels. So much for uh, your Bible study here for the day, you know. Uh. But Luke and John had a hard time with this passage because otherwise you might think that she was some kind of a holy woman, 
since it mirrors that familiar Psalm 23. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over, and in the Psalm, that's God. Whoa. So they take the story and, um, well, and besides the fact that she anoints his head, they take the story and Luke puts it in early at chapter 7 and says she was a sinner who weeps and anoints in the joy of being forgiven. While John, which is actually our picture today, um, presents it in Holy Week, not at Simon's house, but at Martha's with Lazarus sitting at the table and Mary of Bethany anointing his feet in her incredible gratefulness that her brother was raised from the dead. The fact is, the later gospel writers were just a little uneasy. Um, they really wanted Jesus to be the only one who did things that couldn't be explained. So they gave them reasons. They gave them reasons for what they did. The story is pretty bare in Mark. This purposely left unnamed woman with a jar of alabaster. If you didn't know, it's a fine grain gypsum used for centuries for statuary and carving, but it is so soft a rock that when it says it could be broken open, it's a rock, but it can be broken. And it's filled with nard. You don't know. I'll tell you is a plant of the honeysuckle family with pink blooms that grows in the Himalayas of Nepal, India, and China at an altitude of 9,800 feet to 16,400 feet. Its rhizomes are crushed and distilled into an intensely, this is Wikipedia, <laughs> aromatic amber-colored essential oil with a thick consistency. Nard oil is used as perfume, incense, and herbal medicine. Consider the cost of importing something from India at the closest. If you want to say this is expensive, that's a long camel ride. <laughs> we also know, um, so, uh, so people criticized her for doing it, and, um, and Jesus' defense of her was that she was preparing him for burial. And in the first century, how you were buried was terribly important. So those people who are actually executed by the government don't have any of those um, amenities. You know, they're pretty much cast off to potentially be eaten by dogs, by wild animals. Now Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea provide the tomb, but this woman looks ahead and uses the most beautiful nard to pour over his head, standing behind him and pouring it over her head. What we also know from the first century, last piece of historical fact, the alabaster jar was her dowry. That's what it was kept in. It was, it was a treasure that was easily portable um, thing from birth home to husband home. And it would secure her her future security and well-being. It was very hard for a woman in those days to be without a husband. It was the most precious thing she had. And it was the thing that she let go. Maybe. She didn't want to be married. If so, she fixed it. Maybe she did not want to be welcomed back at her parents' home. Guaranteed. What Jesus saw, and Peter saw Jesus saw, and Mark heard Peter tell about what Jesus saw, was a woman who let go of the most precious thing that she had for love at dinner when people were gathered around, and he began to plan to do that too. Each week, we grow closer to putting ourselves in the story, listening, singing, looking at art, 
but I'm going to take you one more step through the frame. I am going to invite you, um, and this is part of the program, and Brad said, why don't you do this? So um, I'm doing it. I'm going to invite you to find a person, um, maybe one you came in with, or maybe mix it up and find somebody else. And I'm going to ask you a question and let you spend just a couple of minutes talking with each other. And so for those of you who are on the online, this is the time when, if you're alone, you get this precious moment that you never have really at night to do a little diary, to answer the question on paper for yourself to reflect upon. So it's an easy one. What is something in your life that you have let go? Now, small, large. Could be a home you loved but you moved to a new one. A friend who stopped really being a friend. A job, a hobby or sport you grew out of. A habit for Lent, something you gave away or for life. The fun of being with friends during COVID. Something of your parents you wanted, but another relative wanted it more. The hope of going to the circus when you were a kid. This is me, a toy you really didn't play with anymore, and there was a younger child who could really use it, and you let it go, and you were really sorry for a long time because that was your bunny. <laughs> Easy or hard, precious person who died, letting go of some of the grief. Could be a habit like smoking, a job you didn't really like very much, but it was familiar, silly or serious. I have, which I already dropped, which I already dropped, a bell, and I'll ring it when I want to draw you back to be in the congregation. And I know that this is kind of risky to do in church, right? But I'm saying enter the story just by telling somebody something that at some time in your life it was precious in some way, and you let it go.
just thank you. Thank you for doing that, which is not part of a common custom and can be hard or easy, just I really appreciate it. <coughs> is there anyone with a bit of a story you heard or you told, probably you told, that you'd like to share? Letting go of, letting go of just what the, what the noun is, what the thing is. Anyone online sharing, Alan? No. Yeah. picture of her parents' wedding um, to her sister, who had no picture of her parents. Who else? Yes, Mark. I grew up with the Christian security of the Lady of Saints back here, and my mom was living in the Lady of Living, leaving a secure living situation to one with lots of unknowns. Yeah. And gave up drinking in December. Gave up drinking the end of December. Yeah. Anyone else? Thank you. May you may you tell that story in your heart. So Enter the picture. How do we enter the picture? This is uh, my father's portrait, taken during World War II, right after, he was a liberator of Dachau, right after uh, he left there, after V-Day. And he became a guard at a processing plant. Uh, it was, it was a camp, it was, like a concentration camp, except the Americans ran it for German soldiers, um, processing those that were going to be uh, involved in war crimes trials and letting go of those who were simply enlisted soldiers to go back home, but, but doing all the registration work. So he had this job, and there was um, a youngish man there who's made his living painting portraits. And he said to my father, I want to paint the war, and your face looks like it's haunted by the war. So it's, it's, on, it's on heavy cardboard. My father said, sure. Now, my father had black curly hair, but his helmet had snapped, the strap had snapped and it flew off and um, a bomb took off his hair and some of his scalp and so he was bald. And so the painter said, I don't know what to do. And Russ, my father, and he talked and so the painter painted in his own hair which is brown and straight because he was also haunted by the war. You put yourself in the stories of Jesus. Different ones speak to you in different ways. Different ones may actually make you anxious or send you off on something that you need to do. We find ourselves in the story 
and years later, it will mean something to those who come after us. You can hear Jesus say, we all do this, this loving of God and one another, something like, I think I'll sit at table with my disciples and all the communion of the saints to come in remembrance of me, of her, of all of us, and it will be holy. Amen. Amen. As we turn to our time of prayer, I invite you to lift up people or situations that you would like to have held in this community of faith. Tom. Duane. Matt. Peter. Samira. Natalie. Yes. Yes. The family and friends of uh, Frank Gilchrist, who was um, a scout leader and a friend of many. Who else? Oh, right in front of me. Vladimir. Yes, Ernie. Joel and Ruth. Any online, Alan? No. Dana. Catherine undergoing uh, chemotherapy, and Mimi, who's grieving the loss of her husband. Yes. Alexis. Sandy, who lost her pet. All right. Happy birthday to Mark. Let us pray. We remember today the extravagant love shown to Jesus 
and his invitation to remember this woman through our actions of loving others. For when we experience the valley of the shadow of death, we are called to be with one another. And so we are with the family of Frank Gilchrist and Mimi and Sandy at the loss of her pet. We remember today those who tend to the sick and dying, caregivers, medical professionals, hospice workers, and humanitarians who risk leaving home and even enter dangerous places to help others. We call to our mind's eye people who need our love and our grace, Volodymyr and the people of Ukraine, people in Myanmar, in Gaza, in Palestine, in Israel, people in California, in the midst of one after another climate crisis, the people in Wyoming who grieve the change of laws. We also lift up those who are precious to us with joy for Mark's life, with good wishes and hopes for Catherine's chemo, for just surrounding love for Alexis and Dana and Joel and Ruth, for Duane and Matt and Peter, Samira and Natalie. O Holy One, hear these and hear all that our hearts say. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We bring our gifts. At this time and in all worship services, we dedicate the gifts that are actually to this church, to one great hour of sharing, to other charitable organizations that do so very much in our midst. We dedicate to God our time, our energy, our talents, our signing of letters, our cleaning up our recyclables, all the ways that in fact we give to God. And we gather those in this church along with the offerings that we give regularly. And for those of you who are guests, please know that your presence is the present that we seek, not any offering of cash. And so we take this time to think about what we dedicate and to consider preferably not 
a jar of something that came from the Himalayas, but such something just as precious, time, energy, and the money that helps those in the world. Let us pray together. God, we present these offerings that they may be used to extend your liberating reign. With them we offer our varied ministries in the days ahead, that each of us may be part of your answer to the cries of the world. Amen. And our closing hymn is number four. 490, Sister, let me be your servant. This season, we're putting a frame around a bit of life. We section off a scene. We look into a face to see what we can see, to know what we can know. Just as we have done with the art and story today, zoom in your focus on the art and story of life all through the week. The divine artist offers us such poignant beauty each day in our own stories, in the stories around us in the heartbreak and pain and joy and awe of a simple moment turned significant. That's what happens when we put a frame around it. 
we zoom in for an existential close-up and search for clues for living this life with more attention and intention. May you be blessed by the sacred frames that surround the moments of your life that you dare not miss. Amen.